So this is the 3D printer room. So what do we have here is um, FDM printers. So as you remember from the lecture yesterday, then uh, so there are three technologies. One is uh, FDM, the other one is uh, SLA, and the third one is SLS. So FDM means uh, fused deposition modeling, which is when you fuse something uh, and you lay it out in layers, uh, in lines and layers, and then uh, by adding layers on top of layers, you get the object, the final 3D object. Then SLA is, uh, stands for stereolithography. Whoa, what a nice print. Without, without supports? Oh. Yeah, OK. Nice. Uh, uh, so SLA stands for stereolithography apparatus, um, which is kind of the original uh, technique, 3D printing technique. And it is when you compress uh, a thin layer of, um, so you compress fluid in, into a thin layer, and then you use a laser in order to solidify that uh, certain parts of that layer. And then you let uh, another layer of fluid in between, and you solid solidify that, and then so it kind of grows, uh, you kind of pull it out. So you have two of those printers in the other room. So um, I'm going to make a t separate tutori t t tutorial about those. Um, and the third technique is um, selective laser sintering. So it uses powder. So uh, then you lay, uh, lay, uh, lay out a layer of powder, and then you use uh, laser to sinter it, so, or to melt it together, so this layer. And that technique is really nice because uh, the powder is supporting overhangs. So for example, in the case of uh, something like this, uh, yeah, I'm going to show in front of the camera. So the overhangs, um, the overhang is the, the back part of the head. And uh, with an FDM um, printer, you cannot really print in air. So it's going to fail. Uh, but then, uh, so for this, you would need a support. But in, in, in the case of SLS, you don't need a support because there's already powder. And for each layer, there's already, a, uh, for each next layer, there's already a support. And you can create, and you can print really complex parts. But it's extremely messy. So you need like a separate room for that. Um, and today, so we are going to look at one of the printers, uh, which is the Ultimaker 2 Plus Extended, uh, so which is a single nozzle FDM printer. Uh, it prints, uh, we are printing here with a PLA plastic. And uh, so PLA is also relatively biodegradable, so it doesn't create so much waste as the other materials. Uh, so it is brittle, though, uh, so you cannot, you cannot create extremely rigid parts. Uh, but they are, so for learning purposes and for most purposes, uh, more like demonstration purposes, it's, it's just enough. So these here on the right side, these are Lulzbots. So you can, so Lulzbot Minis and uh, Lulzbot TAS. So the Lulzbot Minis, um, yeah, they're quite precise, especially when I changed the nozzle from, from the original 0.5 to 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So the old ones, they were also damaged. So they would uh, print uh, so the, the walls uh, of, the, of the prints. They would be a bit offset, so it would be not, not, too, not too OK. But now with the fresh nozzle, it, it actually prints really nice and precise. But these you can use only during the opening times. You cannot use them during, uh, for, for overnight prints. So, for example, if you have like a lot of small parts that you want to print, then you could book uh, all these four at the same time, and you could uh, distribute the prints so that they print in parallel. So you could uh, print a lot of parts in four, a, a lot of small parts in, let's say, four hours. Uh, but for if you have one bigger print, so something like like this, for example. Um, uh, but three times or four times bigger, that would need the, the other printer. So then you would do it with um, Ultimaker um, 2, or we have the other Ultimaker 3 extended here, uh, which has a double nozzle system. But this one has a single nozzle system. So here, like with these Ultimakers, you can print overnight. So you can start the print during the opening times and then uh, come over next morning um, and, the, and pick it up. So no problem with that. Uh, and then we have also one printer that is uh, uh, the Mecta Heino uh, i3D printer, which is from a startup upstairs. Um, and for that, I will do a 
tutorial later. So, but if you want to print with uh, flexible filament, so now it's loaded. We, we mostly use it for flexible filament experiments. If you want to experiment with that, then I can show you how it works. Uh, but for today, yeah, we're going to do things with the Ultimaker. So that y just in case you want to try out something crazy that needs overnight printing, you can start, start using it right away. Uh, so basic thing um, is actually to uh, unload, the, uh, unload and load the filament, so to change the filament. So in case you do not like the filament that is currently loaded, uh, you can change the color. So now it's loaded with the transparent blue filament. And what we are going to do is we're going to load it with this uh, OPQ. Um, is it right, OPQ? Opaque. Opaque, yeah. Uh, opaque uh, filament. So in order to do that, we need to use the menu, uh, which is on the bottom side here. So usually when you will start uh, up the printer, it's going to show these three, three menu items. In order to navigate, you, uh, you use this uh, dial. Uh, so you can rotate it and uh, then you can press it in order to select what uh, like the item that you want. And in order to change the material, you go to the material section over here and then you choose the change one, hit OK. Now it's going to heat up the nozzle uh, until, the, until it's as hot as, um, until it reaches the temperature, the melting temperature of the material. In the case of PLA, it's usually around 200 degrees, like so. Meanwhile, that is happening. I'm going to unload, unpack this one. So usually it's a good idea to store the filament in uh, plastic bags and uh, inside this plastic bag is usually, so we are putting also these little silica bags. So yeah, and, uh, as the temperature is reached, the motor behind the, the printer is going to start to pull the filament out. And uh, as the last step, um, what you have to do is you have to turn the printer around. And on the back side of the printer, there's this button that you have to or lever, I don't know how to call it properly. So you have to lift it and then you can pull the filament out. Also a good practice that you should do whenever you're uh, taking filament out is take uh, some like pliers, like cutters, and cut the end of it so it's flat. So for, for whoever wants to use the filament next. Um, also for these printers, uh, so for the Ultimaker, and the lousy bots, um, you use filament that is um, 2.75 uh, up to 3 millimeters in diameter. So in order to make it to be completely sure, so you use a caliper in order to measure. So now it's, it's reset it to zero. So you just wrap it around like this. So this is 2.77, so which can be considered 2.75 basically. So that's to check the diameter. And as with every other machine, um, so it's a good idea to be slow, but not extremely slow and slow and careful. So when you remove the filament, try to immediately put it into a bag. Try also not to break the bag, which happened. So <coughs> I'll deal with it later. So, and then put it back here. So this is the filament storage over there. Uh, and then to load the filament, you take this. So you see, like not so good example, so nobody cut the end of it. But yeah, that's not, not that big deal. So you just cut it yourself. And then we let's put it on this handle over here and to load uh, first thing that you have to do is you again lift this lever here and where to insert it okay so here and there's a hole uh, where you have to insert the filament so you then you lift this you push it inside and then you release 
And the rest of the process is from the front side of the... We ha uh, so now, um, after unloading the filament, um, the printer is going to ask whether the material is removed and whether the it, it's ready <coughs> to load the new material. And then you have to just confirm that. Then you have to select one of the materials from the list. And the first in the list is PLA, so you select that. Now, it is going to start to slowly move the filament upwards. And this is just enough, so it should be above this blue line over here. And then once you see that it's above the blue line, then you hit ready one more time. And now it's going to forward it. into the nozzle and you have to wait till extr it extrudes the, the respective color that you want to use for printing. So it starts extruding blue and then once it does that then in the menu hit ready again and now it's basically ready. Uh, yeah and then so this we can throw away here in the PLA wastes next to the 3D printers. Um, yeah, now for the printing part. So let's try to uh, find uh, an object somewhere to print. Uh, so I'm going to go to the desktop like this. Let's open the browser. Let's open a new window. Um, let's go to Thingiverse. Let's look for a keychain or key, lab key label. Something rather small and simple. Uh, yeah, I think this is good. So in Thingiverse, so that's in, in order to test a 3D printer. So Thingiverse is probably the uh, easiest way to go in order to find 3D model for printing. So if you don't want to design it from scratch the first time, but you want to get a feel of 3D printing. So, um, and it is a repository of, of uh, freely available 3D and not just 3D designs. Uh, so designs for 3D printing and also laser cutting. And what you need to look for is the Think Files tab here. And for 3D printing, you mostly will use STL files. So you click on that in order to download it. So, and in, on, on the Mac, you can just press spacebar and it's going to open it up in, in a preview mode. So in, in Windows, you need a some specific preview, 3D preview program. Uh, I think there's one in Windows now in the new versions. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, so yeah, so the preview looks fine. And next, what do we have to do? We need to use a Slicer. So Slicer is software that is going to turn your 3D model into instructions for the 3D printer. And what it essentially does is it slices it. So it basically separates it into layers, and then it figures out how each of these layers should be drawn with plastic uh, in the best possible way So for, for, the, for each specific printer. Uh, and for the Ultimaker, we are going to use Ultimaker Cura, so which is a software that is developed by Ultimaker and it's free and open source. And other printer makers uh, have forked it to make their own versions uh, as it is with the Cura Lulzbot. So if you want to do something with a Lulzbot, then you should use that. But in this case, we're going to use Ultimaker Cura. So let's open that.
And here, uh, the first step is to select the printer that you are going to use. So we are going to use the Ultimaker 2 Extended, so make sure that you are selecting the right one. And for the material, um, we are going to use generic PLA. For the nozzle, we are going to use 0.4 millimeter nozzle, as it's the so that's the that's the tip of the uh, so this is the opening that is in the in the printing part. So 0.4 millimeter. So which means also that the thinnest uh, thinnest wall that you can get is basically 0.4 millimeters, uh, unless you specifically tweak it to do otherwise. Um, and then uh, you can select the preset so or, or the profile for the print. Um, so you can select normal, fine, and extra fine. So I'm going to go with normal. And then you can specify other settings. Um, and the most important ones uh, for starters are infill, so which specifies how much material you want to have in hollow areas inside. Uh, so usually like a 10 to 20 percent is fine, so I'm going to set it to 20. And then the other one is no, not this one. The other one is supports. So in this case, we are printing a really simple thing, and uh, we are not going to need it. Uh, but if you're printing something like something like this with uh, with an overhang, then you will need supports. Uh, but yeah, let's move forward and let's import the model. So you go to File, Open Files, you go to uh, Downloads, Key Label, Open. And uh, so it's it's kind of kind of a 3D editor, but without the editing capabilities. So it's editing the model in a different way. So with the right click and, and drag, you can rotate it around. With the middle mouse click, you can pan it. Um, and uh, yeah, with the wheel, you can you can zoom in and out. Uh, so this is how it looks, uh, but <coughs> in order to see how it's going to work with the 3D printer, so we can do a simulation. Uh, so we should slice it, and in order to slice it, uh, you have to press this button. So you set the settings, and then you hit slice. And then you can preview it by hitting the preview button. And by using this slider, you can see how each of the individual layers is going to be printed. And with this slider on the right side, you can control, you can set the, the layer that you want to target, like that you want to visualize. So let's say somewhere here. We'll see. So in this blue thing around, that's called the skirt. And the skirt is necessary in order to help to keep the part down uh, attached to the build plate. Because sometimes the plastic cools down after being laid out. Uh, and especially for flat areas, it tends to shrink. And then uh, the top part shrinks, um, and the bottom part tries to be attached to the to the build platform, but it cannot. So it, it warps, and and the and the corners are lifting. And uh, and in order to prevent that, uh, skirt can help sometimes. Like the best thing in order to avoid that is um, is a platform. Um, so it's the printer, which is completely closed and with a heated chamber inside. Uh, but in our case, we do not have that. But we haven't had too many issues of warping anyways. Like the next thing that you do is you save this to file. And let's just save it on the desktop. OK. 
key label and save. And we can open it up in the text editor, like brackets, for example. And this is how it looked like. So these are the instructions for the <coughs> for the printer. And um, so this is G-code, and G-code initially has been designed to be relatively human readable. So uh, the old, the ancient people, like 50 years ago, they used to enter these commands by by hand. So there would be a big CNC machine, and they would enter these commands with the numbers by hand. Uh, so it hasn't changed much since then. So there are some extra commands that probably are related to Ultimaker or a specific 3D printer only. Uh, but most of the commands are universal. So for all kinds of different CNC machines. And uh, let's take this for example. Um, and what it says, it's probably G1 means moving somewhere. Um, and then x is the x coordinate of uh, for mo movement, so where it has to move. And then the y is the y coordinate of the position. And e is like how much material it should extrude. The Ultimaker uses an SD card uh, for file transfer, so you need to take this and then insert it into the computer. So this is where you're going to put the file. So let's copy this. Just you know, delete all these. Eject it. And then take it out and put it back into the printer. And uh, <coughs> so now we can return to the main menu. So we go to return, and then I could go to print. And here, yeah, it automatically loads a list uh, of the files that, are, that can be found on the SD card. So I'm going to select the keychain, so the key label. And now it's going to start heating up the nozzle and eventually start printing. So it starts printing, so I just wanted to quickly switch to that. Closer to the camera. So usually it's a good idea to stay with the printer uh, to check whether the first um, layer of the print comes out fine. And usually if the first layer is fine, that means it's going to be fine with the rest of the print. Um, so sometimes with the older uh, printers it is that the nozzle jams. Uh, so it, there's so for, the ch for these, these sort of printers, there's usually no way how to automatically detect that. Uh, so which means that, yeah, if it happens in, during the night, then so there's no really, so then in the morning you just arrive and there, there's a failed print. Um, and in order to prevent that, you need to play around with the temperature and maybe speed settings. Like there, for example, that's a good example of a jammed nozzle, so I could point the camera at that one to show what it, what it looks like. So this is printing in just printing in air so this nozzle is jammed. So there's nothing coming out and the printer doesn't know about it. It just executes instructions. But it's less likely to happen with the Ultimaker. So this Ultimaker 2 extended is actually quite quite a stable machine. Uh, so I rec recommend using that for for your initial projects. Uh, so for for the projects next week, because then you're not gonna get bitter at 3D printing in general. So if the printer is gonna fail too often, then it's gonna be 
hard. Um, not not here. So uh, then, so if you want to print ABS filament, then I would recommend you to go to the three D printing lab uh, in Vara. So they have. Uh, so yeah, let's take a look at the, the website and try to find the printing speed. Uh, Ah, okay, up to 300 millimeters per second. Yeah, uh, so this, um, I think it's that's just the XY axis, but then... In the Z axis, it's probably slower. Uh, Otherwise, I think, yeah, let's wait till this prints to the finish. So let's make a um, five minute break and I'm going to set up the, the 3D scanner and then we can switch over to basic 3D scanning methods. Same. Still the same. Three days the same. Um. Are you doing this for the whole week? <laughs> no, no. But what, what are you trying to do with it? You're trying to make a lamp out of it? Just make like LED cutting through the bottom. Ah, okay. of making coffee. Ah. I threw it I threw it away before I made the coffee, I thought. Oh. <laughs> mm. American control, American control grinder. Oh. No. Oh. Oh, you, you actually have the accent. I You're can do hiding. It if I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can do it. <laughs> I can do it, but it takes effort. I want to show this to the camera. Oh, no. <laughs> it's full of fails these days. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a coffee cup, but you cannot really see what's inside of it. But then if you tilt the camera downwards a little bit, then you can see that it's actually a very professionally looking coffee. Like, look, it has this foam layer on top of it. And, uh, yeah, it looks good. And then if you, if you think about that, it probably also tastes good. So, mmm, good coffee. Yeah, of course, like, that's... Uh, 
So over the last year, so this spot over here uh, on the right side of, of the lab, uh, yeah, when, when you enter it uh, next to the windows, next to the vinyl cutter, and the 4K screen has become more like a 3D scanning uh, area. So you can use uh, the 3D scanner. So this is the, the one that is uh, the most operational and kind of the most useful at the point. But uh, what I'm <coughs> trying out currently is this uh, real sense depth sensor. So the D. 300 D435i. Uh, so I still didn't get it working because there's some issue with the USB 3 uh, connection. So, but I'm going to sort it out. But what we are going to use today um, is this uh, Artec EVE uh, or Artec EVA uh, 3D scanner, uh, so which we got from. Was it AdLab? So Jason brought it from the AdLab or like one of the units in, in uh, Alto University, which, uh, and they didn't use it too often. But here at the Fab Lab, somehow, like every week, there are at least like two or three people who are using it. Um, so it's a proprietary, kind of relatively expensive uh, scanner. I think the price of this is 15,000 euros. So be careful. Oh, yeah. So be careful not, not to drop it, but it's kind of rigid. It's easy to hold in your hand. Uh, it's just a bit tricky uh, to operate the, the cables. So it, one, there's one design flaw that it comes together with this uh, adapter box, so which is uh, converting AC current into DC current that is necessary for this device. And when you lift it, then this AC, this, so this converter thing, it hangs and it pulls uh, this wire down. And then, uh, so we already had had it broken once, and thanks Laure for fixing it. It looks really good, so it looks as new. Um, we also have somewhere like older scanners, like you can use the Kinect, or there, there was one Acer uh, scanner that we can you can use if you're interested. But uh, so for one week um, adventure with the 3D scanning and 3D printing, you have enough already what to do with 3D printing. So I would suggest you to use the most stable one, which is this, for 3D scanning. Uh, yeah. Um, and then with that, you can also use some rotary surfaces. So today we are going to use this chair over here. Or is it like here, this one? So you can sit here. So instead of walking around with the with the scanner, you can just turn around on this one, and then somebody can stand next next to you or the object, and can just hold the the camera up to the scanner. And then we have this wow, rotary structure, so which is actually from an art installation that a student made last year. And, and she, she left it here as a, as a present. And we immediately discovered the useful aspects of it as, a, as the 3D scanning surface. So what you can do is you can put it here and you can rotate it around so you can put something smaller on it. So for example, like this box here. And then you can position the scanner somewhere next to it and point at the object. And then you can, instead of uh, again going around the object, you can spin the surface. And this, this is what lets you to uh, see the object from all, all sides that is necessary for 3D scanning. Uh, so yeah. <coughs> we will, like in a minute, we'll need oh, like a volunteer. So who is gonna be okay to be 3D scanned? All right. So but now let's switch over to the desktop view, and on the desktop you should be able to find this Artec Studio 11 professional application. So please come closer. Um, yeah, I wonder, so I could actually, yeah, this is the first time when I'm doing a presentation on this computer, so I could actually connect it to projector, but some, some other time. So yeah, Artec Studios Professional, Artec Studio Elena Professional. Uh, so you open up, and it looks like this. So 
On the left side, there are all kinds of tools that you can use for 3D scanning and post-processing the print. And on the right side, you see a panel for, for layers and um, basically for the scans. So here, th there's you'll see a list of um, just that's a collection of scans that you're going to make uh, within a project. This log window, mm, I'm not sure, I never used it, but uh, okay, that's good to have it. So in case something goes wrong, but in order to scan, you need to press this scan button here. And uh, um, to this preview button, it actually uh, maps to the play button over here. So you can you can operate with the mouse or you can operate also with your device in hand. Uh, so it's easier to do it with the device, of course. So if you're alone operating the the scanner, then you just press this, and it's going to start to uh, so yeah, direct your scanner at the base that supports the object. So you have to bring the scanner a little bit down so it actually you can see the ground. So how about uh, someone sits down on the chair? So who wants to volunteer? Okay. So in, in order to start scanning, we need to identify the ground first. So we are, yeah, so there's the shoe somewhere like this. Um, and then the next thing is, so we have to press the record button either on the desktop or uh, when when the scanner is in preview mode, then the play button, so that we previously pressed for pressed for preview, uh, so now it it will map to to the record button. So you will have to point it at the ground. So now we'll wait where wait for the now scan the object message, and then you hit button once more, and now it's in recording mode. And now have to move. Ah, uh, see. Uh, Maybe I'm just gonna stick with the torso instead of head because I think like it has problems with hair. So I now start to spin slowly. Okay, so here I will stop. So hopefully this is going to be relatively successful. <coughs> so even if you didn't take the ground first, did you still... Uh, no, I did, I did take the ground this time, but I still had to move up. So, okay, so all these scans here, so I'm going to transition to here. So on the, and we see on the right side, so we can delete basically, so... <coughs> Scan 16 is what we are interested in. So everything here. <coughs> Delete. <laughs> this is the one that we like. So we can have fusion. Yeah. This looks good. I'm going to save this. No. Okay, good. Um, so now let's do some post-processing. So we go to the editor. So let's hide the things that we do not need. Uh, yeah, and then here, so again, let's view it as uh, orthogonal, orthogonal view. Then from the front viewpoint, actually decide and the eraser let's make a rectangular selection until here and until here erase so looks all right and then we can go to tools and filter out smaller objects
Yeah, so there are still some left, so we can go back to editor. We can use the eraser and lasso selection. I'm gonna hit and hold down control and select these areas that I don't want to be there. Control, click, drag. Control, click, drag. Erase. Nice, so we have this. I go back to tools and then hit on hold filling. And now, yeah, I hope this is going to go faster. So while this is calculating, then uh, I can show you some other things, some other scanners that we have. So there is a, a software that is called uh, ScanAct. And you can use that with Connect. So we have a Connect and we have this other one, which is the, which is the so how is it called? The Asus, uh, Asus computer one there are so these two ones so one is the the connect one uh so which is not being supported anymore i mean like microsoft is not doing anything with it uh, at the moment not selling and then the other one is the asus uh yeah asus Ixtion pro live yeah that's the camera and you can use it with scanact The holes have been filled uh, here. So yeah, and after this you can do simplification or remesh or smoothing or normal in inversion, so all these things. And once this is done, then you can go to File, Export Meshes, and you select the location where you want to export them. So here, uh, I'm going to export it as no, this is rendered already. Not ANSI. Rendered torso. And I'm going to select STL as the format. So you see there are all kinds of formats that the software supports, but we just need STL for 3D printing and then save and OK. So STL is basically triangulated mesh, and it's not just for 3D printing, but you can open it up in, in uh, other software like Blender, for example, and then on, <coughs> on the desktop, here we have Academy, ANSI, and Ranger Torso. So here on the computer, there is a viewer installed. Uh, and here you can just double check whether the model exported fine. And from here, you can then take over the file and uh, bring it to the 3D printer slicer. and and print it or model it up to you really so let's take a look at this um, scan act software i haven't i'm gonna set it to body uh the bounding box is gonna be one by one meter uh aspect ratio la la config file so then i just hit start and i wonder do i need some extra drivers in order to Yeah, it cannot detect the, the scanner, unfortunately, so... Yeah, so as I told, like, I, I was trying to configure the real sense sensor as well, but there's some issue with the USB 3 link, apparently. Um, but yeah, so these are the possibilities, so at least like I, I showed you a complete workflow with the, with the Artex scanner, so sorry that it took so long. Um, but yeah, over the week we can try out to make it work. Like with the uh, scanner, we can try also one of them computers and so on. You have a cat here. No, I don't. Otherwise, I would want to try and scan a cat, but they can't stay still for like more than ten seconds. I'm like, well, that's I think in impossible. Huh? My my cat, no, it's not not gonna work. Uh, I think it's. They decide to like they see you looking at them and then they're like, oh, let me look at you too, and then they start moving in. 
I think oh, yeah, he's, he's just gonna run away and then maybe after 10 minutes he's just gonna show her Ah, maybe if there's food So for example, if oh. you put food on the on the rotating table and the mm -hmm. cat cannot get there and you could just spin it around yeah. together with the food and it's like the, the, the head would be moving Yeah, yeah. Mm, The cat likes uh, hummus and guacamole What? And coconuts Coconut milk. What? And coconut oil also. Like, uh, many many, many people have uh, have, tra <laughs> been, have been traumatized during the past three years when when I have a cat. So I think I'm the only one who is really compatible with him. So because he's waking up like three o'clock in the night, sometimes not going to sleep at all, and then. Oh. Like people usually tell that uh, like the last experience was with a with a fr friend of mine who, who told that your your cat opened the door. <laughs> I was sleeping. My, your cat opened the door and he jumped on me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like level three. Like from the sauna. Ah, you the sound sound door. Door. Wait, yeah. you put him in the sauna and yeah, we close the door. <laughs> <laughs> no, not me. Somebody uh, like one of the two because I went to sleep with sleeping pills. Mm. And he opened the door to hurry or somebody and yeah. jumped again on him and then he put him in the sauna and then he came uh, because he wanted a warm place or whatever and then he opened the sauna door. So here we are at the printer and now <coughs> if we move closer we see that there is something there. So that's the, the key label, the key label thing that we managed to successfully print and in order to remove it uh, so the best is to use uh, kind of a knife so ah well let's let's uh, call the others so it, it's good to use a tool like this knife um, so there are like multiple of those uh, laying around and then what you do, you carefully try to lift one of the corners of the print. Sometimes when the print is bigger, you don't even need a knife. You just grab it and then uh, try to move it, and then it, it's easy to remove that. So once the corner is off, so it starts sliding on the surface, and you can just take it like so. <coughs> and so you should be able to remove this skirt relatively easily. So. Here you go. Hmm. Yeah, it's like a breaking sound, but I'm not, I'm not, it's not broken yet. So yeah, take a look. Is there any way to polish the, the layer? Yeah, you can use sandpaper. Oh. Or I wish we would have a can sandblaster. Ah, yeah, we have this XTC3D that was also featured yesterday in the video. Yeah, this kind of crazy chemical. So I recently did um, uh, um, a lot of work in terms of uh, trying to understand what chemicals we have in the lab and uh, yeah. also like reading all the data sheets. Yeah. And so there are two components. One of the components is relatively harmless, but yeah. then the other one, so the epoxy something oh. that that is, so you have to be careful. You have to wear gloves when working with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then that's it.